I can just be straight up with a lawyer. Before, I couldn't be straight up with a lawyer because they knew a lot more than I did in regards to situations. And sometimes lawyers have better relationships with certain labels. So they might want certain deal terms for the label because that's what they know the label usually want to do. And sometimes that might not be what's good for you because they might, maybe the label like gave you a couple of lawyers to work with and they've selected them because they know that yeah, this lawyer is going to do it the way we want it to be done. And a lot of the time, that's an issue for the artist later on. Our sponsors for the perspective, Fireway Pizza are offering you guys 20% off using our discount code AD20. Use it today, man. Save money, be patterned. We got you. AD20, Fireway Pizza, the perspective. Get me my bro, R1. We had to come back four months later. Come on, you know, it's all you right. All you right. I had to finish off what we started. Yeah, man. So, bro, we were just talking about, you see when, like, I've been at a and you're, you're a manager, you know how it goes, bro. More time artists just want that big upfront money. Yeah, that big advance, yeah? Because if someone's going to tell you, listen, you can get this, you can get this, they're always going to go for the highest number. What do you see as the pros and cons in taking that big upfront advance? I feel like if you take the big advance, you know what, it might be good for now, but it just kind of adds more pressure to you. I feel like, for example, it's like, I've done both. I've done, with some artists, different artists, different situations. Some artists, it made sense to do six-figure deals. Some artists, it made sense to do just five-figure, smaller deals because of maybe just like where they were in their career. You know, sometimes some people need money. I'll be we were in a time where money, there's bills to pay, so money pays the bills. So for some people, it's like, yeah, let me get the money first so I can kind of invest in myself, sort out situations and just kind of be in a more stable place. For some artists, they're, they're already in a place where they already kind of have stability. So for them now, it's kind of just, they want to make sure that they can kind of take their thing to the next level. Like different people kind of come into the music game at different times. So I feel like the pros, for let's say taking a small deal is at least you know that you can recoup quicker. The quicker you recoup, then the quicker you start seeing proper money back from your royalties and everything like that. Obviously, an advance is literally an advance. You still have to technically give that money back. That's what a lot of people don't realise. They look at it as free money. They don't realise that technically they're working a job. So when you're working a job, you've got to actually work and technically pay that back. Obviously, whether you pay that back now or you pay that back in the future, um, yeah, at some point you've got to pay it back. So really and truly, like to answer the question, I'd say like you've just got to kind of realize that if you take a big advance, there's going to be a lot of pressure on your head. It's uh, like uh, what is the pressure though? But obviously now the label's got to make their money back. Like it's a business, so because it's a business, they're going to be looking at um, how much money they put in. They're going to be looking at their like back ends, their budgets, and kind of going cool. We've spent X amount on this artist, so we need to be seeing X amount by this time, and if we're not seeing it, then realistically, that's when artists start to get released because it's like, cool, well, we've taken that loss, so let's move on to the next artist. I, I feel like, obviously, like let's say you take a small amount, don't get twisted, you can still get dropped very quickly. Like That doesn't mean that you're guaranteed to stay, but it just means that, you know what, they're willing to try more things with you, they're willing to spend more on maybe, like let's say, a feature or marketing or whatever. You get it? like. Uh, there's actually going to be a budget that they're working with at some point. So whether they might not share that budget with you, but just know every time they've got to go get something approved from higher up. And let's say now they've given you a big amount up front, maybe them conversations are even harder. Because it's like for that big amount, they're expecting a lot from you. Maybe they're expecting you to already have the relationships. Maybe they're expecting you to kind of already have everything ready. But yeah, at the same time, there's a lot to it, to be fair. Like, I can't speak for, on it more than what I know sort of thing. Every, everyone's situation is different. Bro, just like, what role do you think a manager plays in the deal structure of an artist signing in collaboration with a lawyer? Um, I feel like it just, I feel like a manager plays a big role because I feel like with my lawyers, I have good relationships with them so we can actually just be realistic. Like sometimes managers might not realise um, that they need to chat to the lawyer, they might not even know what the deal themselves. And sometimes that's where the first issue is. I remember like when I had my first issue was because at the time, I mean, the lawyer, we didn't really speak. So because we didn't really speak, the lawyer didn't understand what I was trying to do with the artist or what the artist wanted to do. So the lawyer just treated us like any other customer and just gave us the standard um, agreement, which at that time, when we looked back at it, it was like, yo, this don't make sense for us. But you get it, we was young then. So we made the mistakes and we learned from it. But also, and I think that another thing is, Lawyers typically, you gotta kind of tell them what you want in the deal. Literally, that. They're not always gonna tell you what the best thing, because if they don't know you, it's just like just 
once we sign off the deal, we get our legal fees paid yeah. for. And that's it. So, bro, so you said the first time you kind of like realised things could have been better. So, without saying too much, what have you now learnt to now try and put in your things going forward? Like, So, I've done enough deals now to kind of know what I need in a deal. And like a lot, a lot of the time, it's like... I can just be straight up with a lawyer. Before, I couldn't be straight up with a lawyer because they knew a lot more than I did in regards to situations. And sometimes lawyers have better relationships with certain labels. So they might want certain deal terms for the label because that's what they know the label usually want to do. And sometimes that might not be what's good for you because they might, maybe the label like gave you a couple of lawyers to work with and they've selected them because they know that yeah, this lawyer is going to do it the way we want it to be done. And a lot of the time, that's an issue for the artist later on. Now suddenly the artist is trying to get out of the deal and now they're finding out, oh yeah, because they've done like a, let's say four or five month period, like it doesn't benefit the artist. And then the artist is looking at the management like, wait, why did we agree to this? And the management's going, but because the, that's what the lawyer said to agree to. So it's like a lot of the time you've just got to kind of always speak to a couple of lawyers. You've always got to try, kind of like just have loads of conversations because the reality is you don't know people's relationships and you don't know what people are speaking about behind the scenes. So just, it's like me and you chatting right now, I might go speak to the next man about you and you won't even know that. Like, the industry is such a small place. Everybody knows everybody. And it's like, you'll start to realise that each label has their own selective lawyers that they go to, that they like to work with. And when people try to do different things and go with different lawyers, that's when sometimes people get better situations. Like, but it's like sometimes people are just comfortable with, you know, they're trying to get, they're trying to make a quick deal. They're just trying to keep the label happy. And it's like, at the end of the day, in the long run, it might put you at a detriment. That's yeah. the best way to explain it. And I think, bro, this is this is this is these are these are not exposed. It's just the it's the, the business that we're in. Literally, that you know when you look at when you so for anyone who doesn't understand when you have these deals, right? The conversations you kind of like get kept out of the conversations, and then your lawyer will then tell you what the other side has said, and you're thinking, wow, but what was what was really said in those emails or those Lushy conversations that, about Lushy me? Lushy that. You know, and it's not to say to you like, oh, they 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 won't they won't do the deal with a, without an option. Yeah. And then you'd be like, no, nah, but I'm not doing it with an option. And then somehow, somewhere you may see, right, there is no option in the deal. And you're thinking, wait, but if I didn't push, I'd have had this this option, which doesn't benefit, as you said, the artist. It, it benefits more the label. Um, so when you had the first situation, I presume that's Simba, right? Yeah. I presume. When you saw things that at that point, you know, obviously you were young. Bro, you, you guys were really young, bro, so it's like, I was like 18 at 19, really yeah, young. Yeah. How did you, what What made you think that weren't right after the fact, if it was okay when you did it? Like, what made you think, wait, this doesn't you make know sense? What? Like, cool, I was doing law at uni them times. Oh, really? So yeah, when I was doing law at uni them times, it's like, I was doing contract law. So I was already reading the sort of stuff that the lawyer was doing. Obviously music is a bit different to that, but I was already noticing that there was a lot of stuff the lawyer wasn't doing that he needed to do. And I'd be going back and forth with the lawyer and just kind of show them that, yo, like, obviously they must have given us, um, I think they gave us a cha a junior, they gave us a junior lawyer. To I, do your deal and yeah, to, yeah, yeah, literally yeah. that, to do our deal. And I think that was the issue because they didn't realise how big the song was going to be. So it's like, there was a lot of mistakes that he was making that I must have clocked on. And I must have told him them times that, yo, there's certain contracts that we need to sign with other people that's involved with the song that if we don't sign now, it's going to be expensive for us later. Yeah. The guy said, no, don't worry, you don't need to do that. No, you don't need to do that. Even in terms of like the whole um, licensing period, all of that, there's a lot of stuff that I was looking at and saying, yo, don't we need to drop that? Make but it's bit, like- Make it a bit shorter. Yeah. yeah. But it's like, because I've been told that, you know, what lawyers know best, all of this, all of that, I've just kind of looked at it and said, cool, you know what, let me not speak too much. Let me not kind of, you get it, get on the wrong side of the lawyer because I need a lawyer to make sure we're patterned. Like, if, the, if I'm not cool with a lawyer, the lawyer might just do us over sort of thing. So you get it, because I did, I spoke up, but I spoke up to, like, in the whole, it's weird, it's weird how certain um, companies work. There's a lot of people involved, so it's like, I might speak up to that person, but that person might not share the information with that person. So at that time, there was a whole issue that we had around the song where now, cause, because contracts weren't tied down. So now suddenly when this thing's booming off, everybody wants a, a slice of the pie. Like, and the prices are going up now. Literally that, literally that. And, it's really that. and it's suddenly like, yeah, this song's done this in the charts this week, so I want this amount. Mm -hmm. I want this credit. I want this, that, that. And it's like, yo, but when we was doing it, it was literally just me, Simba, the producer that was in that room. 
and then obviously DTG as well that, was in, that came into the room later on. But it's like, yo, now I'm hearing X man, this man, that man, and I'm thinking, yo, you lot was never part of the picture. But you get it, you got to charge it to the game. This is how the game goes, isn't it? It's business. And I, and I think also, bro, another thing is, again, for me working at a label, bro, sometimes, bro, they will just go through with things knowing that the paperwork is an all the way tied in. It's like, yeah, it will, it will get figured out. We have to rush to this thing. Did you, I mean, retrospectively, do you find that a bit, not, not weird, but it's like, we could have taken a bit more time to pop up. No, 100%, 100%. I understand that, because with music, a lot of it is time sensitive. So I understand that's why a lot of the time people are saying, yeah, you know what, let's do this later, let's sort that out later. But it's always costly. That's what I realised a lot of the time, that's always costly. And the conversations that are hard right now, they only get harder later on. Like, people think that success kind of changes them conversations. But I realised it makes them conversations even harder because now everyone's ego is built up because of the success, everything like that. So nowadays, I just try to get the hard conversations out of the way early and just kind of say, you know what? This is what it is. If it's if we're not happy with it now, then we've just got to understand that later on we're gonna not be happy with it later on. So, like, just kind of sort it from early, sort of thing. Yeah, bro. And do you know, sometimes I think it's a bit of not. I don't want to say this. It's almost like not an inferior complex, but it's like we don't know what we can actually say because we just we're coming she into that, the game, bro. She that, that's, I think that's what it is. It's like it's only when later on, for example, you start getting advice from other people in the industry that tell you, oh, well, no, you should have done this, you should have done that. But not a lot of people want to speak on their deals because it's like, oh, the well, next man got more than me. Or, like, my deal, technically, it's a bad deal, so because I've taken that L, I don't want to share it. But I feel like when I look back at the deals we've done, I think it's because I was able to share them deals with certain people that I was able to understand the game better and I was able to kind of leverage in the next situation and just, you get it, be realistic. How many deals have you roughly overseen, like, through your management company for yourself, like to major labels and distros? I'd say like around seven, like seven or, yeah, seven or eight deals in the past, like, let's say three years. Well, how old are you now? Uh, just turned 24. Okay, 24, bro, that's, so, bro, under 25, done all those deals, yeah. Is it, do you feel that you get, you got the respect? They, like, they know, like, they, they know, they know R1, they know it's R1 now, it's not like... Yeah, I'd say so, I'd say so. You know what it is, I realise it's a numbers game. It's like, man's done the numbers, so the respect's there. But at the same time, don't get it twisted, it's like, not everyone wants to see you win, so... Sometimes people, like, they know, but they don't want to give you the respect. And that's fine, you just gotta... Without saying who, but what type of entity wouldn't want to, like, see you win? Like, without saying who... Um, I feel like it's a competitive game, so at the same time, it's like other managers, it's like... At the same time, it might be certain a and R's. It's like everyone in different positions. Like I feel like it's the same way like where we're competitive. I realise, cool, if this guy's the one doing deals, that means technically he's taking deals that I could be getting, sort of thing. So because of that, I might not want to you know, support his thing, repost his thing, share his thing. But I feel like that's normal in every industry that you're in. But it's like I realise that, yeah, sometimes let's say we do a deal and technically the label's on the losing end because they've had to pay more for the artist. That might be a reason why they don't really, the animosity might build up just because of that. Because yeah. you got, it feels like you kind of got one over them. Literally that. Yeah. But it's a business game and I always say like, I work for the artist. You get it? At the end of the day, I'm just basically representing the artist. I'm trying to speak on what the artist wants at the end of the day. So a lot of the stuff I say, it might not be me that actually like led that decision. It's just me that's got to push it. and. You get it? I manage the situation sort of thing. Has, is this something I'm, I'm projecting a bit? Have you ever had people trying to take any of your artists behind your back? 100%. Like, all the time. This, this industry is a shark. Like, there's a lot of sharks in the industry. And, like, I feel like a lot of the time, everyone's watching your team. They're seeing who's the weakest link. They're seeing who's easier to kind of, you know, like, have conversations with. And it's like, every artist, as soon as the artist starts to blow, people start to surround them because they're, they're saying, yeah, they want to take them to the next level. And sometimes, don't get twisted, I've met some guys that's actually helped us and helped taking us to the next level, but sometimes not everybody's genuine. Some people just kind of want to take the artist under their wing. And it's like, you'll notice that all the time, there's so many stories that people can tell you that, yeah, wow, this is a situation I relate to. This happened to me with my artist where next man has come to take it. And don't get twisted, it's even like there's been times where I've worked with an artist and the artist has ended up saying, no, nah, they want me to manage the situation. And yeah, yeah. it's like, Sometimes I have that conversation with the management and let them know that, yo, this is what the artist has said, let's co-manage or solve the situation because I personally believe whoever you come with is who you should stay with sort of thing or who you should grow with.
unless let's say like it was it was it wasn't meant to be sort of thing. But when that happens, so like, cause your character, you, bro, you're just chilled, you're laid back, bro. So when in a situation you think, and bro, let's be real, like, cause typically the person who's gonna try and take your eyes is gonna be someone that you actually already personally know to an extent, cause the game's that small. So when that happens, yeah, just or like, how do you internalize it? Do you get vexed? Do you just, do you just like, do you know what? You can't have emotions in this game. I feel like the people that have emotions in this game are the people that you know, like might li um, limit their ceiling. Let's say sort of thing. It's like with me, I'm kind of insensitive to a lot of situations now because it's it's been happening. I'm used to it. I've kind of got to the point where I've charged it so many times. Man's past that now. Like I understand how I have to move. And a lot of the conversations, I kind of have state conversations and just kind of say, I'll say it to my artist that yo. Man can already see X, Y, Z wants you. So just know that, you get it? Whether you entertain the conversation, just know what it's going to end up with or know how they're going to try to do it. It's like a lot of the, I realise there's a lot of guys in top positions that I know why they're there. They know how to sort of do certain things for artists that make the artists want them. And it's, I'll be real, sometimes, you know, their management might not be doing what they need to do. So sometimes it's better for the artist. And, but sometimes it's not even better for the artist. It's just that the artist has just been kind of wild and, you feel me? Statistically, Rover done a madness, bro. How many, how many, how many streams has it done all together? Do you know across all platforms? Um, like maybe 600, 700 million, something like that. This may be me sounding like I'm getting in business. You recouped? Quickly. Okay, so that, so that Rover's recouped, yeah? Yeah, yeah. After you recoup, bro, like, with a song that big, for Simba as an artist, do you, ever, does he ever, do you ever feel you can do a bigger song than that? Or do you think, to be honest, do you think, okay, that, you're going to be successful, but that was a once, once in a lifetime? You know what, I don't actually believe it was a once in a lifetime. I just feel like, um, it's like, it just depends who you're surrounded by. Like, it's like, I've seen artists that's had similar success to him go on and have more success like that later on. But I just feel like with the way the scene is in the UK, it's hard to do similar things again. I feel like it's hard because... For example, a lot of people in the UK might not want to see someone that's around them doing better than them, doing stuff like this, or the right people might not want to work with you at that time, or it's the it's an egos thing. Like I feel like the UK is different to different industry, like it's different to different countries. Like I feel like I see collaboration in a lot of other countries. It's like if you look at America, it's like um when let's say Nardo Wick popped out and he had a hit song, suddenly everybody was working with him, which helped him have more hits. Like people didn't mind putting the pride behind them and collaborating. But in the UK, you can have a hit and everyone's kind of just waiting. They don't want to work with you yet. They want to wait a couple of songs. They want to kind of have the pride and say, nah. Positional yeah, literally that, literally that. And it's like, let's say artists work with you early on and lock in and you get it, drop the music with you, stay away. That's how you kind of go to the next level. I feel like um, I've seen different scenes where that can be the case and that's been the case. And that's why artists are doing well and have continuously done well. So. so who you know game sort of thing. Also, just, just closing off on, on Simba's situation with Label, bro. How, how, how does it come together when you guys decide to part ways? Is it you fulfilled your requirements or is this like, was he dropped? Did you want to leave? How does, how does that conversation happen? I feel like for me, I could already kind of see from a mile away sort of thing. I feel like um, as a manager, I've just been able to be a couple of steps ahead to kind of understand what the a and thinking, what my artist is thinking. And I feel like, um, with Simba's situation, it's like the momentum, the label kind of took away the momentum and that was because music wasn't dropped. So due to that, it just kind of meant that. Wait, bro, we got scared, but so that means music was being submitted and they weren't approving it to be released or? Yeah, do you know what it is? I feel like um, for what Simba had achieved at that time, like- He should have a free hit to do what he wants. What did you say, uh, he, should, he should have had a free hit to do what he wants, yeah. in a way. But I feel like, Suddenly now every, there's a bigger team, everybody wants to kind of say, no, we should go this way, we should go that way, we should do this, we should do that. And obviously Rover now got put into the category of pop. So now suddenly it's like, oh yeah, because it's pop, this is what you should do. Uh, let's do bigger pop songs. And at that time, if that's not the artist's image, it's kind of him not being true to himself. So it kind of made, there were certain songs that were being pushed that were saying, yeah, let's, you lot should go with this one. But um, yeah, so because of that, it just kind of meant that after we'd dropped the project. Obviously we had the next um, option to drop the next stuff. But then when we, we already realised when the last stuff, we said to ourselves that we can't go into the next project with the same sort of situation where it's taken this long to put our music. So us being us, we just said, let's be real from the start. Let's just have the conversation and say, yo, like 
what's the plan for this next tape? If the plan's not making sense, then let's kind of, you know, just end it there. Because we had a great relationship with Parlophone. All the people there, are, they're good people. And because of that, we was able to have the real conversation of how is everything looking for the future? And obviously at that time, there were certain things that's happening at the label. All it takes is for one a and R to leave. And then suddenly you're thinking to yourself that, yeah, no, nah, that's not the place no more. So at that time, like, our, um, our A&Rs suddenly started to leave. So when we noticed they started to leave, we just said, yeah, that's kind of showing us what we need to see, that this isn't a place for us no more because they're the ones that brought us in. So we just decided at that point that, yeah, you know what, we wanted to leave, like, and just kind of do our own thing. Bro, question again. Um, something like I've observed. When a label makes, like, when something goes pop, right, and they start making decisions, I sometimes think it creates a bit of a divide between the artist and the manager at times because the manager may be like, nah, bro, I don't think we should do this. And the artist is probably agreeing, but it's almost like sometimes they want to please the master, if that makes sense. Did you ever have, I won't say conflict, did you ever like have like their opinion almost getting in between you and Simba's creative opinions? Yeah, like definitely. But I feel like um, with Parlophone, because of what we had achieved, they were willing to compromise a lot of the time. And I feel like sometimes labels are willing to compromise. So it's not that all labels are bad. Like I've worked with a lot of good labels and had success with them because they were willing to compromise and they understood that, you know what, certain moves should be done later on or certain things should come at this time. But sometimes they don't want to do that. It's like, yo, I've signed you, so this is how it's going to be and this is how it's got to be. And you know what, I feel like everyone learns from the mistakes. So even maybe the label might learn from the mistake for the next artist. That's why the next artist has success. And then even the artists might learn from their mistake of trusting and then when they go to the next situation that they're in, that's when they have success there. I feel like a lot of the time, artists that didn't have success earlier that everyone knows should have been successful, they later have success later on because then they find the right team. Yeah. That's why I always say to artists nowadays when they're talking to me or trying to get advice in regards to their deals and all of that, I always say sometimes it's not about the money, it's about the people behind it. Because let's say the people behind it aren't on your wavelength, it's like when now it comes to getting out music, you're going to realise sooner or later that, well, like, I'm stuck here. And unless I do what they want to do, nothing's been done. And when you do nothing, that's when you lose momentum. Yeah. And when you lose momentum, that's when now suddenly you lose your, um, let's say, you lose your position, you lose your job at the end of the day, you lose your career. So, you feel me? Bro, you're, um, so what I thought, you created like a management company, right? Yeah, actually. Okay, so break us break break it down. Why you created that, and 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 why your management company may be different. What's your USP? So uh, my company is called um, Rax Productions, Raxway, and you know what it was. It was like I wanted to do more. I felt like I got to the point where I was doing like way too much, but I was doing it all by myself. Obviously, like I always kind of said to myself that I want to do create a movement. I want to do something for the area. I want to be able to kind of like co-sign area, lead the area, so manage, a management company was the best way to do that. And it's like, I had a lot of people around me and I wanted to kind of put them all on, but it's like, you know what, sometimes I looked at it and said to myself, I can't sort of just be feeding people, I can't be giving them money all the time. Because it got to a point when I'm giving guys money all the time, it's like, they're getting to the point where they're just entitled. So I just suddenly said to myself, you know what, if I suddenly give everyone similar opportunities to what I had, then maybe they'll get the same passion that I've got. Maybe they'll want to sort of take their thing to the next level as well. And it's like, then they can make their own money. I just kind of said to myself that um, I can't, what's the quote? I can't, um, like, if you teach a man um, how to uh, fish from a well, whatever, that, yeah, that quote yeah, there. Yeah, teach a man to fish, yeah, instead of just giving it for you. Yeah. yeah, literally that, then they can do their own thing. So, yeah. obviously for me, that management company kind of helped me to do that. And at the start, it was just myself managing artists. But then when I had my accident, it kind of made me have to find a different way to obviously work with other, to work with artists still. So because there was art, there was guys around me that I'd been training, when we go to all the shows, I'll bring my boys, I'll tell them, you, you, know, you know what, take a position each, you do this, you do that, you do this. And after a while, when it comes to sessions, some of them are coming to sessions. I know that they've got a passion for coming to, for being involved in the creative. So I've said to them, cool, you know what, I want you to be the day manager. So that means that you go to the sessions with the artist, while I do the back end, the admin stuff and... The business stuff. Yeah, literally that. If we operate that way, that means you're involved, I'm involved. And it got to the point where now I was collecting artists. I was collecting a lot of artists. I had um, Simba, I had Silver, I had Kawali. And 
Back in the days, I used to try to go to all of their sessions. <laughs> then it got to the point where I had uni as well. I've got uni as well, trying to go to their sessions. Obviously, um, I've got family stuff I need to do. Um, I've got my child as well. I'm looking at it and saying, and I've even got my relationships. I've got like my, a girl I'm trying to focus on. I'm saying to myself, yo, how am I going to do all of this? It's so it's a lot. Yeah, so that's when I started saying, cool, man them. You know what? You do that. You do this. You do that. At the end of the day, you lot are now going to actually make money from this. And it works for you. It works for me. And I wanted to put you guys on anyways. And it's like I wanted to kind of come up with my boys. So it was a way where it worked for everybody. And it's like now we've got to the point where because it's been a couple of years in, it's now I'm able to hire more people and kind of give more people more positions. And I plan to expand more and pick up new artists as well as new um, people in management positions. I feel like I've looked at other guys that's done similar things and they've kind of helped me. They've given me the advice on how to take my management company to the next level. And with the success of my artists, it's only kind of helping us to cement our place in like, the industry with what we're doing. I mean, you've got some people in who's been in, who are a part of your company who've now got label jobs, bro. Literally that, literally that. Like, that's one thing that I've always said to all the guys. I've always kind of said that the final goal is to put them in a position where they can make career changing moves themselves, where they're an exec themselves, where it's not just me that's an exec. And so it's like now, for example, I've got Lenny, who, Lenny. yeah, big up Lenny. Lenny works over at 5K. That's one example of that. And it's like there's other guys on my team that are coming up that's already having conversations with regards to label positions that I know that soon they're also going to be in a building. And that's kind of how it starts. I feel like that's everyone's end goal to sort of have be able to be in a position where they're making money. Why have you not taken up a, an exec or a junior exec position in, the, in it? Have you not been offered it? And if so, what would you put it down to? Because, bro, your track record is already is, is clear as day. There's been them conversations. You know what it is? I've always said it's a timing thing. It's like, I'm young. So that's another reason as to why I didn't want to do certain moves too early. Like, it's like certain moves come with responsibility that I said to myself that I'm ready for this responsibility. It's like I was at uni. So when I was at uni, that's when we had all the success. I said to myself, I'm already doing too much. I can't have an A&R job and be doing all of this because that means that's going to tie me down to that. And it's like, I also realised to myself that like I, from early, I was looking at what 2K was doing, what um, they were doing with 5K. I was looking at what um, NQ was doing. I was looking at what Disturbing London was doing. And I was saying to myself that, you know what? These are the sort of stuff that I want to do. These are the sort of plays that I want to do. So there's got to be a time that I come in that I can't sell myself short. And like for me, I was willing to make sacrifices. You've got to kind of make sacrifices in this thing if you really want to you know, get your money's worth and get your value. So for me, I always said that, you know what, the main aim is to get my brothers in, get them in positions, and then later on, I'll get myself in. And it's like, I've had the success where I didn't need the money at the time. So I knew what the NR was paying, and I said to myself, you know what, I'm already seeing money like this. So <laughs> me, me getting an NR job is not really going to do nothing, like, except for maybe boost my ego, and all of that stuff there. So I was, it's like, what I do is already A&R. Everyone knows I already do A&R. And it's like, when I've had six, seven artists all in similar situations, like, at that point, you have to see it as what it is. It's A&R. But it's like, I don't... I want, I want to give you that call and say, bro, let's go studio. Let's yeah. do this tune. I want, that, that, I want ain't a joke when it comes down to trying to make these songs happen. No, you man. get it. Man's got to be in the field. That's how I see it. So it's like, like, I feel like if I wanted to be an a and I can be an a &R. It's not that, man. Man's had the conversation many times, but I've always felt that it's not the right time yet. But I plan to do that in the future. And I plan to do more with Raxway. Like, I want to turn Raxway into a label. Raxway is a label. It's like, we already do label stuff, so we already release music. But now I want to start a whole distribution and be dropping music with other artists that I pick up in the future and be operating both as management and a distribution. And in the future, then do a joint venture with a label. So it's the long-term plan. And it's like, I'm, I'm near the age where I'll start making a move. So it's just a matter of time and a matter of finding the right building for myself and for my company. But yeah, I feel like, yeah, it gets to a point where you've got to kind of realize when you've got to make the next move to get yourself to the next level. So, or when you've kind of reached the ceiling for certain things. So me, I understand that it's getting close to that point where I feel like if I want to take things to the next level with my company, then I've got to be in more of a senior position. I've got to be in more of an exec role. I've got to do things like this, doing interviews, stuff like that. And now that's why I'm starting to do all of this stuff now, because I realise this role comes with certain responsibilities that you've got to fulfil. You're still a young man, your father. Again, from the same culture. 
do the parents get it? Like, do they get it now? Uh, my mum gets it now. You get it? Well, really? Mom, she gets it? When she's taking all of them flats, when she's enjoying right. life, when all the aunties are coming to her in church and say, oh, why your son's this? Oh, I seen your son there. I seen your son in this newspaper. It's like, my mum didn't used to get it. But we've had our situations, innit? It's like, when I was young, there was a lot of dumb stuff I used to do. So that's why she didn't get it. Then when I started doing music, it's like, I wasn't even focusing on uni. I'm leaving lecture to go there to do this, to do that. But it's like, I feel like, um, yeah, now she gets it. She has to get it now. But at the start, they won't get it. But it's like, not a lot of people will get it. It's like, um, like you look crazy to begin with. And then when it works, then you're a genius. But I was fine with looking crazy. And with a lot of stuff, all the stuff like I do, it's like, that's how people see it until it goes well. Like you just, I just took the risk and it worked out for me. So my mum gets it now, but you feel me? With a lot of stuff, she always kind of don't get it till she gets it. Totally left bar, bro. You can dodge this one, bro. Do you think like, do you think the girls, the women, any woman who's dating you or seeing you, do you think they get how how this lifestyle is like twenty? Like it's just it's up and go. It's it's, it's not balanced. Um. Like. How do I feel you like find sometimes, it? I feel like it depends, like, different girls I've spoken to, like, some of them have just understood it from the jump, like, like they understand that, cool, if I'm settling with a busy man, then I've got to be understanding what comes with that life, that, cool, he might not be available today, or this might come up that day, or whatever. That's another reason as to why, like, I built that company, so I can kind of have time, because I realise that I need time for different things. But it's like, I feel like certain people, they don't get it, and they won't ever get it, and that's fine, like, you get it. I'm not meant to be for everyone and like, you get it, they're not meant to be for me so I think I don't, I don't really know how to sort of explain that one but I understand it now, like, I feel like life gives you lessons so man's learnt my lessons and kind of understand why certain relationships might not work, worked out because you feel me like, literally that. For raising your profile is an important thing, if, what do you classify yourself as because are you you say entrepreneur or a and R? I mean, obviously there's titles you have, but how do you internalize who R1 is in the music industry? Like, I don't really give myself a title because for me, it's like, if man needs to be a worker, man will be a worker. If man needs to be an exec, man will be an exec. If I need to just be behind the scenes, man will be just behind the scenes. It's like, I feel like um, different days, I've got to be a different person. That's how I kind of get myself the opportunities and kind of get myself the profile I've got today. Like, people know me for so many things. Like, if I needed to be a dancer, I would be a dancer. <laughs> I can't dance, but I would be a dancer. So, you feel me? Well, people that, bro, man, I, I said, we were joking the other day, our one's been doing this drip thing, you know. Don't, 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 let him, don't let him confuse you. I remember thinking, this guy, bro, do you know what it is? You've got a very vibrant personality and energy. Like, I think people, people, they're not going to forget you. You walk in the room, you've got a presence about you. And at a young age, bro, it's, it's, it's good to see that you're not, you're not the kind of person like who's, Whose heads down, cowering, you're, you're you, bro. That kind of character, what do you put that down to? I feel like um, it's the way I came up. I feel like obviously I used to live in Nigeria. So even when I lived in Nigeria, I feel like I learned a lot of things, I seen a lot of stuff, and that kind of built me. So it kind of made me realize, like, a lot of Nigerians, I realize they're very hungry people. They're really ready to work because of the struggle that we've come from or like what we've seen when we were young. So. That kind of helped me, that kind of made me want to always take the opportunity because I literally needed to take every opportunity when I was younger to kind of make it to where I am today. And don't get twisted, I'm a shy guy, but it's like when I need to speak, like I'll speak in it, you feel me? That's, that's me, like the way I'm speaking right now, that's not me in real life, you feel me? <laughs> catch me? Catch me on the wrong day, I'm a, I'm a different guy. Sometimes I just like to be in the background and observe, but it's like I realise that if I want something, then I've got to get it and to get it, I've got to kind of, you know, speak, you feel me? Couple of lessons. What what kind of business lessons have you learned being in the industry? Um, hmm. Don't trust nobody. You feel me? Everyone says it, but it's like I think my mistake I used to make. I used to put a lot of trust in people. I used to think, you know what? Like because man, he said it to me. That's what he means. A lot of the time, people can say things to you, but they either have different intentions in their head, or let's say because of certain situations, they don't fall through. So it's kind of like, don't trust nobody. Even if, if it comes from a good place, it's like sometimes, yeah, it might not come through. So literally, that's, that's one thing. I feel like that's, uh, everyone says it, but it's like, no one takes the lesson. Even me, don't get twisted. Me saying that, I still don't take the lesson sometimes. But you get it. 
You feel me? So it's like, that's one thing. Another thing is, yeah, don't have emotion in business. If you have emotion, you won't get far. I feel like that's the one that I always try to tell my guys because everyone always feels a way in business. It's because me, I don't feel a way with a lot of things that I'm able to get to where I am and I'm able to either forgive guys or just kind of be bothered when it comes to certain things. Um, number three, pride. Like, don't have too much pride. Like, I feel like for me, like, I used to have a lot of pride and I think pride was what used to limit me when it came to certain things. At what and, point? When, 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 what period was he you were having that pride? Um, I'd say when I was younger, you know, like when I was younger, there was a lot of opportunities that I used to miss out on just because I used to be kind of like, no, I don't want to shout my man. You feel me? Like, man's been doing my thing. My man should shout me. And that stopped me from a lot of stuff. And then I'm seeing other guys leapfrog me and I'm saying to myself, yo, yeah, you feel me? That should have been me. And then after like seeing that a couple of times, it gets to the point I couldn't charge it to the game no more. Man just said, no, nah, like man's got to switch it up. So man started switching up. And after man started switching up, I realized that, yo, me putting my pride down kind of gets me more opportunities. So why do I have pride? Like, you feel me? Like, so now it's like I'm a humble guy. So me being humble is what's got me a lot of opportunities. It's like even right now, I might not sound humble, but it's because I know I have to say that because you're looking at me in a certain way. So <laughs> you feel me? Like, if I don't say that, you're going to put me to the side and tell me why didn't I say that. that. Nah, you so, know, you get it. Do you know what it is? I think, look, like they tell you pride comes before a fool, bro. And I think this, this, this game humbles all of us, bro, at a certain point. Because we can't, like, so, like, people got to understand, yeah, like, when you're seeing someone like R1 in front of you, yeah, like, what bro's doing is not normal. In our, in our small circle, because we're around the movers and shakers, we're all doing something, but, bro, there's like, what, 65 million people in this country? You go now say, like, under 25s? In the music industry, in our culture, in our scene, how many have done what you've done as a manager, bro? We're not even getting one hand, bro. Maybe a couple fingers, pause, if even that, bro. So I think people just don't understand sometimes like the magnitude of what's been done, bro. Because you can look to your left, to your right, you can shout a man, but bro, like, this is not a normal thing, bro, that man's achieving, bro. Like, and if it was, bro, we'll be seeing thousands of managers, bro. If I said to you, name me, 20 successful managers in our, in our scene now, you, you'll struggle, bro. Be 20 men who are cool, who are, but who've who done something that's gone global, you're one of the few, bro. And you're putting like, people into the game and you're managing like, multiple artists, bro. That's, when I looked at the range of artists you're looking for, and also producers as well, right? You've got your own studio as well, right? Yeah, bro, look at that, this is, this is, it's not to gash you, bro. It's, it's, it's super commendable, bro, because there ain't no manual that someone said, oh, okay, cool. Um, yeah, Raph, here you go. We've given this to you. Go and do it. You're going to go it yourself, man. So you got to definitely... Yeah, pride is humble, be humble, but, like, bro, you're successful, bro. Yeah, I think that's something I've learned this year because a lot of the time I don't speak on a lot of my wins. Like, maybe other people might speak on the wins, but I don't speak on it. And you know what? Sometimes you need to speak on it. Like, for people to see you for what you are and to realise, like, what you do and how you got here. It's like a lot of people won't know the backstory until you kind of start saying it and speaking up for yourself. It's like, I used to make the mistake where I don't really share my wins. I won't post the achievements. Sometimes I used to think, oh, this is flexing. Let me not do that because then the people on my snap ain't going to like that. Like, if man's in the hood and man's around all the hood guys and man's now posting all of this, it's going to make all of them feel a the type of way. So I didn't used to do it. But then I started realising that when I'm picking up artists, the artists don't even realise what I'm doing for them. Or they don't even realise the position I'm in. They don't know that, oh, the future they just got, it was me that got it. They don't realise it's because of my relationship with X, Y, Z or what, what I've achieved, that certain people are willing to trust me. So that's why now I start to speak up on these things and I realise that if I want to be an exec, if I want to get to the higher levels, if I really want to do this thing properly and build my business, I've got to kind of build myself and, you know, start having like being, having the confidence, saying those things and, you know, knowing when to be humble and when not to be humble sort of thing. Yeah, I, mean, oh, like I, I will pick up that call, pick up that phone if he, if he needs to make something happen. And it's true what you're saying, bro. Sometimes, like, humility, like, some of the things I've done, I just, I, I was a bit sim I'm similar, I'm like, yo, if I say X, Y, and Z, bro, it's going to make other people feel a way. And I don't want it to feel that like energy. Like, because it's not outshining the master, but it's like, bro, some of the things you've done, people don't really understand, like, right, you know you're around, like, a serious guy. Or serious person. I don't know. Yeah, man. But then, but then, bro, also, let's talk about the recent success now. Margs, 163 Margs. 
Hey, big up Muggs. Yeah, big up Muggs. Big up Muggs, bro. Top 40, still out in around like 43 the second week. Yeah, yeah. Bro, like, this is... So let me, so let me get the chart successes. So, Simba. What, what chart successes have you had so far as a manager? So, I've had Simba, Simba charted um, like multiple times and he's been on a couple, he's done a couple of remixes which has now charted because of that. So, a couple of charting results with him. Um, I've had Silver, who charted with um, the Old Age track um, back there in the Euros. I've had um, Margs, who charted obviously Top 40. I've had, also had, um, there was the Nines record. Um, I was working with Show and Proof, so Show and Proof done the Nines record, um, and there was a Nines record which was this year that done top 20. So the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Shout out Show and Proof, man. Oh, yeah, yeah, big up Show and Proof, one of the top producers in the UK. Literally, it's crazy because that was something that me and Show and Proof must have had a conversation about maybe a year or two ago. And literally, at that time, my friend was managing a female singer, so I must have shouted him and just asked her to do some stuff on the track. And well, now it's a top twenty, so it's crazy, yeah. So, bro, in that, but in that situation, so were you managing Show and Proof? Were you just working, or were you just no? Nah, so Show and Proof was just a close friend. So I was doing management activities for him. You can call it management, but I, I look at it as A and R and sort of thing. So you get it. So, but yeah, bro, how did you? Okay, cool. So this is something I actually want to hone in for managers, yeah, because I talk to quite a few managers, probably most of them, right? And there's some who come into the game. And bro, they don't have no relationships. They don't. They they don't have relationships, bro. So it's like they're almost like manager label babies, where yeah. they need the A and R to do everything. They need the publisher to do anything. They ain't got a hotline, bro. What made you know that you need to build your own relationships external so what the label can give you? I feel like from day one, because of like my background, that's why it's like I wasn't from London. Like I was living in Swindon when. We had the success and it's like even when I went to uni, my uni was in Coventry, so I didn't know nobody. So it's like I kind of realised from early that, yo, if I want to kind of have success and whatever I do, I need to know people. There's a couple of men who've seen what it's like when they've come in as youngins and they've had success. You're one of them, Ronaldo and Paddy when they came in with Rams. And it's like, bro, you lot came in with, and as kids, bro, like literally kids who ain't even graduated yet, bro, and having like, success way bigger and I think when you have that type of like entry point bro you just like this ain't even what your family can tell you there's not like who can really pattern things for you and I think the way that you've come out of it you still kept your you, I think you're becoming more and more sharper in the business do you get me have you ever at any point for I just don't want to continue music you know I want I want to like this is long man I'm not happy I'm not feeling it yeah 100 percent obviously um I think we touched on my accident earlier but when I had my accident, literally, I swear, I'd told the man them, yo, this is it. Like, I don't care about the success. I don't care about the money I've made. I don't care about what I've made. I don't care about all of that because I'm not enjoying it no more. In the aspects of, like, I realised the industry is not what I thought it was. And it's like, all these numbers, they don't mean nothing to me. It's like, if it's not making me happy, why am I here? Like, I don't, like, have the passion for music itself, I think I have the passion for what it can do for people and I have the passion for kind of, you know, making a difference in people's lives. I think that's my passion, trying to change people's lives and bringing out the potential in people. Music is just one of the ways in which I could do that. So, yeah, literally at that point I just said, yeah, that's it. But you feel me, after a couple of months, it's like I was saying to myself, am I going to start law now? Am I going to focus on law? And then I had to kind of say to myself that, wait, I'm in this position for a reason. All of that stuff didn't happen by chance, it didn't happen by luck. Because I thought, I said to myself, maybe it happened by luck. Then I started saying, wait a minute, it happened, it, like, it's happened more than once. Like, it's maybe, okay, cool, maybe I'm meant to do this. And I think the man them kind of forced me to realise I'm meant to do it. Certain people that, that I was talking to at the time were just like, yo, like, can you not see what you've done? Can you not realise? Maybe because people haven't given you your flowers or you haven't kind of taken your flowers when you've been meant to take it. Like, you haven't realised, like, what you're going to be. And... It's like with the accident, it's like I made it for a reason. I feel like the accident happened for a reason and I survived it. And maybe that was, God's put me in a position. God's chosen me up for a role. And until I fulfill that role, then you get it. I'm just going to have to be here doing what I do. So that's why now I've said to myself, yo, I understand this is the position I play in people's lives. And 
I'm good at that, so I've got to stick to it and I've got to do it. Clarity of your purpose, isn't it? But before the accident, so are you, am I right to suggest that you were feeling a bit jaded anyways before the accident happened and then that just compounded it because you couldn't really yeah, move literally around? That, literally that, I feel like obviously life went from zero to 100 and when life is fast, you don't have time to process things, you don't have time to think. And because of that, I think I was in that phase of life for maybe two years. Like, man was touring the whole world. Man was going to a different country every, like, couple weeks. It got to the point where, but I went to, like, this year I've been to, like, 10, 12 countries. But I can't even tell you about the memories from it. I couldn't even tell you about what I'd done in that country. Every country just started feeling like London. Like, London, London. Just because I was in there so fast. that I was even just chilling in my hotel half the time. So it got to a point where I said to myself, yo, I've got to kind of slow down. When I slow down, I can process things. After I had that whole moment where I slowed down and processed things, then I started to understand, oh, okay, cool. Like, real life started to hit me. Like, when real life started to hit me, real life started to make me see things the way I needed to see it. Like what? Like what? Like, you say real life, but... So, like, for example, it took maybe, um, it took a uh, death, someone passing away that was close to me. So when my grandma passed away, that kind of made me understand life and understand that, like, she created a legacy, so I looked at her life and I was very happy with what she had done and I said to myself that, yo, like, I've not got no legacy. I've not created nothing. Then when I had my accident, that was real life because someone else died and it took someone else to die for me to kind of wake up and realise that, yo, I'm not doing something with my life or I've not achieved nothing with my life. If I die right now, I've not created nothing. I've not made no movements. I've not made enough changes to people's life and it's like, I've not done enough with my life. Like for the potential that I know I have, I've not fulfilled my potential. And I know I'm hard on myself, but I also know what I can be doing and what I should be doing. And I also know when I choose not to do certain things. And it's like, um, even just for example, finishing uni, like when you step out of uni and now you've got to find, the year after where you've got to find yourself a job, like that's real life, that's a wake up call. You've got to wake up and smell the coffee. And when you've got to wake up and smell the coffee and you're looking at, around, you're looking at you and your friends and you say, wait, this guy's here on this salary, I'm still making zero pounds. You kind of stay to yourself, yeah, I need to get up and do more. You start feeling like a bum, all of that stuff there. Um, it's like, I even feel like, um, yeah, losing a job, that's real life. Some people lose their job and when they lose their job, they realise how hard life is and that's what causes them to change or fix their priorities or whatever. Even relationships. I think relationships does a lot to a lot of people. I've seen people that was in relationships and after the breakup, that's when they now have their best year because now they've kind of woke up and I think people get comfortable in relationships and kind of lose the discipline and all of that that they had before. Or sometimes relationships is good for people because it helps bring that. Like it just depends on you as a person. But I feel like that's all the stuff that I say is real life. Like there's a lot of stuff like that. Like people go through their quarter life crisis, their midlife crisis, all of that stuff there where, yeah, I feel like when I'm, like you're mentally aware about yourself, that's when kind of you can progress to the next level. And yeah. Because that the, the industry is like there's a diary and you just you just you just going places. You're not existing. You're just and like I said, bro, bro, you don't remember days. You don't even remember. You only remember moments, bro. Literally that. Literally that. And that's what I kind of tell to people all the time. Like, a lot of the time I'm asking people, yo, what's the day today? Brother, it's it's bad. Brother, ask, you don't know. You just know you need to be somewhere. Literally that. Literally that. Like it's got to the point where every day is the same day to me, <laughs> and I'm always telling people it's the same shit, different day. Like it's crazy. Like, bro, I've lived this day. 600 times and it's bad because people are looking at me and say yo like are you good bro and i'm telling them no no it's not that man's not good it's just that this this could be a friday don't a, a friday is when you guys finish working like you laugh oh yes friday's like bro man's got a go studio there's this there's this thing man has to pattern or this cool man has to take it doesn't it doesn't stop bro it's relentless literally that, literally that. that's why i always say like time is a is a context time is made up it's crazy because it's like me, I don't even live by time no more. I just live by when I want to do something now. So it's, it's crazy. Like my birthday was like maybe two, three weeks ago. I've not even dropped my birthday post. I'm going to drop it next week. And <laughs> it's my birthday then because I want it to be my birthday then sort of thing. It's like I just live on my own terms sort of thing now. But it's mad because, yeah, I've lost control. Of, I've lost track of the days, everything like that. It's funny. Bro, in closing, yeah, um, I won't say all sorts of advice. We really touched on lessons. And you basically said your purpose, yeah. Um, but for you now, bro, like, like what, what, what is your greatest achievement that you feel you've, you've made thus far, or you've achieved, sorry, in the industry thus far? 
Uh, and I know there's a lot more to come, by the way. But what one, okay, what one means the most to you, shall I say? But I, yeah, I feel like definitely it's got to be being in this industry for this long because being in this industry for this long, this industry is very demanding. This industry is very challenging. This industry takes a lot from people and sometimes it doesn't give people anything. I know people that's been around three, four years, they're telling me, yo, but man ain't even like, achieved much. You get it? And I feel like to be around this industry, there's a lot of fake people, like there's a lot of real people, and it's not easy. It's actually not easy because I can, I can be real and say that, yo, there's times where I've done certain things and I haven't been paid. And for some people, that's it. That's their breaking point. They can't take it no more. It's like, nah, man's leaving this industry. There's times where certain guys have said certain things to me that I'm looking at it and saying, yo, I should punch my man up. And, <laughs> but if I do that, you get it, people are going to look at me as a bad guy. You feel me? And there's times where I've said stuff to guys that they're looking at it and thinking the same way. And <laughs> you feel me? <laughs> it's very full. Don't get twisted. This whole industry is very full circle. That's what I always say. Like, I'm not going to sit here and act like man's a good person all the time. You feel me? Man's playing it. You get it? Everyone has their moments, isn't it? But, so man knows that. But um, at the same time, I'd say, yeah, being here for this long, that's definitely my greatest achievement. I feel like, obviously, some people might tell me that, oh, it's the numbers. Some people might tell me, oh, yes, yeah, the, it's the network. But I'd definitely say it's been around, like I came in here in 20, I came into the industry 2019 and this is 2023. Yo, that's four years. I know some guys that was only here for a year and now they're back to whatever they was doing before. I know some people that just had enough of it and just said, no, nah, that's that. But you get it? when I look at the guys I look up to and how long they've been around, I say, yo, I've still got a long way to go. I say, yo, I, Am I still going to be here in 20 years? It's crazy because it's like every year, just I just say to myself, wow, I made it for another year. And yeah, I made it for another year. But yeah, definitely that's my biggest achievement still. It's crazy.